Good morning to the brave ones who came on time. Will be rewarded by an almost on time start. Um, right, so this session is going to be a very interesting one because we have a mix of papers uh, cyber, CBDC, uh, regula regulatory compliance uh, costs. Um, so, very much looking forward to that. Um, we have here to my right Matthias, who will present the first paper, and Andreas, please. Uh, he will present the first paper. Unfortunately, the discussion, Katrin, has been uh, has fallen sick um, uh, after last uh, yesterday's dinner, um, and she will uh, join us remotely to give her remarks, for which I'm very grateful, especially given that she's not feeling very well. Um, but so, I give over to uh, to Matthias to talk about uh, CBDC and banks. and banks. Yes, of course, CBDC and banks. Yeah, so uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for, for including this paper in the, the program. It's uh, great to be here. So this paper will be about CBDC, so Central Bank Digital Currency, and it's called CBDC and Banks Disintermediating Fast and Slow. And this is joint work with Rhys Bitter and Tim T uh, Jackson. And I work at the Bundesbank, so these are just our few, some of our employers. So I, I think the, the, yeah, the motivation for, for this topic is also that the ECB Governing Council has approved the start of the preparation phase for the digital euro last year. And what is the digital euro? The digital euro, this is like retail CBDC. And retail CBDC, this is central bank money in digital form uh, for the public. And so this paper will be about retail CBDC. And the digital year introduction, if it will come, I think it will impact central bank policies along many dimensions. You can think about payment systems, monetary policy, and uh, et cetera. However, this presentation today will be about how might the retail CBDC affect financial stability. And I think one concern with CBDC was articulated in this quote by, by Fabio Panetta, the novelty with CBDCs is that they would provide access to a safe asset that, unlike cash, could potentially be held in large volumes in the absence of safeguards at no cost, accelerating digital run. And against this background, we kind of like what we want to do in this paper is we want to like take a quantitative angle to evaluate CBDC and also use our analysis for, for like some policy implications, I would call. And what we do for this, we have like a twofold approach. So first of all, we will, um, in the paper, we have novel uh, survey results from German households on their uptake of CBDC. And like guided by our insights from the survey, we actually develop a quantitative macro model, uh, which features two key features. So it has CBDC, retail CBDC, and importantly, it has endogenous bank runs in the model so that we can really like uh, better understand this financial stability dimension of CBDC. And, and what are the overviews and main takeaways from, from our paper? So if we look at the survey results, I think one key result that we found here is that German households appear open to the digital euro. So what do we mean with appear open? We find that 46% of surveyed households would adopt the digital euro. And in that case, we talked about the unremunerated digital euro. And if we look at the financial stability implication, what we find actually is that there would be a substantial reallocation from bank deposits to the digital euro. So here, like that, you can like see like a bit this in, in normal times, there would be a, like the slow disintermediation from the away from the banking sector. And then we actually, we, we also in our survey, we then expose the households to a, like a hypothetical banking distress scenario. I will be later more precise what we uh, told them. And then we see that in such a scenario, actually, the share that of uptake of uh, CBDC of digital euro increases. So then like more than 50% would actually hold like a digital euro, which we interpret as evidence for fastest interdemiation, uh, referring back to this initial concern that was articulated in this quote here of like uh, digital runs. And guided by this insight, by guided by the survey, what we do is we, we develop like a, a, like a model, sorry. Uh, we we, we do develop a macro model and what we have here is that slow and fast disintermediation has opposing stability 
or financial stability impact. So what we have is that CBDC, it actually, um, because now if you introduce CBDC, it competes as a payment method with deposits and also cash. And as a consequence, it raises the, the refinancing costs of banks. And in our model, this re results in a reduction of the, the balance sheet of banks and also in reduced leverage. And so as a consequence, we have lower leverage in normal times, which has a positive effect on financial stability. But then the other one is that like really CBC is this potentially very convenient asset to run to in a run. So it makes like a run more and more, more easy. And this has a negative impact, a negative impact on financial stability. So we have these two opposing channels. And now we can actually use our quantitative model to kind of like take the, what, what are the takeaways from this model? And the first result is that unremunerated CBDC, like let's, without any additional feature, has an adverse effect on financial stability and welfare. So what happens here, if you introduce CBDC, it reduces financial stability, makes runs more likely. But, and this is I think the very important uh, result here, but if you actually complement this, the CBDC with a holding limit, which I think is part of most policy proposals, actually this result reverses and CBDC has a positive impact on financial stability and improves welfare. And what is the logic behind this result is that if you introduce the holding limit, you kind of like get the, 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 the positive impact of a new payment methodology you have the positive impact of this increased stability from slow disintermediation, but you contain the, the fastest intermediation channel. And then the, one of the advantages of a quantitative model is that we can also try to do some, yeah, we can try to, to get, provide some numbers. Of course, this is like a model, so please interpret these numbers with a lot of caution. But our model suggests an optimal limit in the range between 1,500 euros and 2,500 euros, and that depends on the demand for CBDC, this optimal limit. Let me, let me come into, let me provide more details on the, on the survey. So here we, we have this um, we included in the, in the household survey that is regularly contact, uh, conducted by the Bundesbank. We introduce questions on a digital year and the projected adoption. And for this, uh, we, we basically have um, answers from 6,000 participants from April 2023. And uh, what we asked them, we want to understand what would be their uh, potential um, holdings of uh, digital euro in different environments. We talk about like status quo slash normal times. And then we also have like the system-wide banking distress scenario. And actually, we also have some questions on where we, where we introduce some remunerated CBDC, but in the interest of time, I will skip that for today. So today, I will mostly only talk about unremunerated CBDC. And before showing you the results, I think how do these survey results contribute to the discussion around CBDC? There is so far only very limited survey evidence available. And here, really, in addition to like providing new evidence for Germany, a very substantial country, we also have this new dimension on financial stability and banking distress in our survey, I think providing these insights for, yeah, on, uh, for financial stability. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the survey. So we inform the households in our survey first that the ECB and the National Central Bank plan to um, that investigate to introduce a digital euro. And then we, because, I mean, in the survey, I think they, on average, like only 30% of households have heard about the digital euro before. So we give them some information, every household that kind of like that they have something to think about the digital euro. And here, which is important that it would be issued and guaranteed by the ECB and the national central banks. It would not replace uh, cash or accounts with commercial banks, but would be an additional offering alongside these. I hope it goes back in a sec, yeah, sorry. Uh, and then the digital euro would enable everyday payments to be made digitally, quickly, easy, securely, and free of charge throughout the euro area. That's the most information they get, kind of like. And what can, and then we, we expose them. We, we ask them to allocate funds among different assets. So we want that they allocate between digital euro, cash, bank deposits, and other financial instruments. And, um, and for this, we kind of like give them a portfolio choice in which they should allocate 1,000 euros among these uh, among this assets. But initially, we say like there is no digital euro available. 
and then we ask them the question again and say, now you also have access to like a digital euro for your portfolio choice, which is unremunerated. Okay. So let's have a look. What, what is our, what do we find about here? And I think we find that these households appear open to the digital euro because around half of the respondents actually would hold the digital euro. And then if we look at the, the allocation, households on average allocate around 10% to the digital euro. Um, so this you can see at this chart here below. So we have the, the dark blue bar is always like the portfolio allocation without the digital euro when they didn't could choose it. And the light blue bar is the one with the digital euro. And you can see it's cash, deposits, other financial instruments, and the digital euro. And so we find a substantial uptake of digital euro of 10%. The digital euro to cash ratio is around half. And if you look at the deposits, so the second bar from the, from the left here, you see that there's a substantial reallocation from deposits to the digital euro. Uh, and then we also have like, if we look for instance for, we, we can look a bit more into detail, and then we kind of like classify keen respondents. These are respondents that have positive holdings of digital euro. For these households that basically choose digital euro, they actually hold more digital euro than cash in, in this hypothetical portfolio choice. So I think this shows like, I mean, there we have this evidence for the slow disintermediation here. So this like substantial uptake reallocation from banks to households. And now we, we wanted to go a step further and we presented the household with a banking distress scenario. And, and now we basically say that they have from credible news sources some doubts about the stability of the banking sector. Uh, that also could affect your bank. And if this were to happen, you might have problems accessing your current account at short notice to withdraw money or make credit transfers. That's what, what we then tell them. And then we, we, we ask them to redo this allocation. First, how would they allocate the money without digital euro than if they have access to the digital euro? And so this is, I think this is the, the and this is basically how now the portfolio allocation looks like. And we now see like a greater openness to digital euro. 56% um, of respondents would hold them now. And if you look at the, the distribution, you see cash is the dominant asset to run to. But I mean, less with the digital euro, which they would hold around 20% here now. And the other important thing is if you look at the deposits, there's also fewer deposits remaining in the bank when this hype, the digital euro is available, which we interpret as this um, evidence for fast disintermediation. So let me, yeah, let me skip here. We have some more results on a bit more on the heterogeneity part and what are key drivers. But I want to go to the to the macro model that we built. So basically, we have found. In the survey, there's evidence for slow and fast disintermediation. So what we do is we build a macro model with CBDC and system-wide bank runs. And this is a quantitative framework calibrated to the euro area. And we, we use basically the survey part to also to inform our model. So we have the reallocation from deposits to CBDC in normal times. And we, we, we have an increased willingness to shift to CBDC during banking stress. And we can use this model for the implications of the digital euro for financial stability, broader economy and welfare. And then we can also go a step further and like put different design features in our model and evaluate how would they affect this potential trade-off. And here like design features, you can think for instance about holding limits or remuneration or like a feature that, that you like, you can then put into the framework. And what is so kind of like the idea, so I mean, what, what is kind of like the contribution of this model to the to this discussion around the CBDC? So this is the first uh, kind of like quantitative new Canadian model with CBDC and these endogenous runs. So they kind of like put in this policy relevant framework that has been often used like this DSGE type of model, but now we can use it also for CBDC debates around financial stability. And let me give you a little bit more details on the on the model, so this is a new Canadian model which has two key features. So feature number one is that the model has um, CBDC, and this CBDC competes with cash and deposits as a payment method and a store of value. So as a payment method, so basically because you have now this additional payment method, CBDC reduces the value of, the, of deposits and cash as a mean of payment. 
And then you also have that CBDC faces no storage costs or at least less storage costs than, than, um, uh, than uh, cash. And therefore, it is relatively inexpensive to hold CBDC in large quantities. Uh, kind of like also remembering back this initial um, this initial concern about this accelerating of digital runs, so we we put this in in that model. And then the other key feature is here that we have this endogenous um, runs on the banking sector, and it, this 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 runs depend on the state of the economy, the state of the financial sector, but also it is affected by the policy choices. Right? So if we have different um, setups of a, of a CBDC then we will have a different um, probabilities of run. And what happens during a run, households shift their, their deposits to cash and if in CBDC if available. And here, remember this, this idea that because CBDC has no storage cost, it is like very convenient to run to or more convenient to run to than to, to cash. And um, so kind of like what are the main mechanisms of this? Oh no, sorry, <laughs> this is a new slide, so I screwed up. Uh, and we, we calibrate the model to the euro area, and importantly, we exploit the survey. And what we do here is to exploit the survey because there's no historical data on CBDC. We match our CBDC to cash ratio from the survey. And then we solve this model in, with nonlinear solution methods so that we have everything correctly solved. This bank runs, multiple equilibria, nonlinear dynamic, occasionally binding constraints for uh, zero lower bound, holding limits, and so on. But so what are the kind of like the transmission channels of the model? And this is the idea that CBC has this opposing implications for financial stability. On the one hand side, we, we have this liquidity premium channel that operates mainly in normal times. So now you have CBDC, you have this new payment method, and this reduces the transaction service of deposits. And now because it reduces this transaction service of deposits, it reduces also the demand for deposits. As a consequence, banks have to pay more interest for the deposits to still like satisfy their demand, which results in a, and then because of this increased funding cost, they reduce the balance sheet and then they have lower leverage and this has a positive impact on financial stability. So it's kind of like this slow disintermediation channel here. And the other channel is that this is like kind of like this opposing, this fast disintermediation, this is that we have the storage at scale channel of CBDC during runs. So there's no inherent technological barrier that prevents scaling up CBDC holdings. It's also very fast to transfer money from deposits to, to your CBDC account. And, and because it's very easy to hold them in large amounts, it kind of like makes it easier to run. And this has this negative impact on financial stability. And so now what is kind of like the dominating channel here? I mean, and that's the nice thing of having this, this quantitative model because we can compare the economy with CBDC to an economy without CBDC. And I will focus here on two criteria. So the first one is the financial stability criterion, which is what is the annual run probability in these different economies. And then to kind of like um, assess the entire economic impact, we, we focus on welfare and the economy as a summary measure. And so how does affect CBDC the economy? Um, and the first one is like, this is our CBDC under like um, our kind of like our main specification um, for the demand for CBDC. And then in the middle, you have the no CBDC. And what you can see here is the run probability with CBDC is 2.5%, while with no CBDC is 1.34. Huh? So really like CBDC ha increases the probability of a run. So it has, it really increases financial fragility. And I mean, and we, we also basically, even if we take like a more optimistic scenario for the, um, the interest in CBDC or the demand for CBDC so that we have slower, the slow dissemination channel, even then you can still see that uh, this is the CBDC keen, you know, like still the economy is, is um, basically worse off with, with CBDC because welfare is slower than in the no CBDC case. So CBDC decreases financial stability and welfare due to fast disintermediation. And let me really say, I mean, we can turn around this result, but we really would need to get to a very, very, very high demand for CBDC that is very far from our survey evidence. So if you take this unremunerated CBDC without holding limit, we have the storage at scale channel dominate. And I think this is really, I mean, there has been this, a lot of this policy discussions about complementing CBDC with holding limits because you kind of like can enable the gains of CBDC, but you contain the, the storage channel. 
and there's this active debate, I think, about the level of the holding limit. And this is also where, where our model can speak to. And so we then basically look how does the holding limit affects the, um, how does the holding limit affects the financial stability and welfare? And initially, if you like, if you increase the holding limit from zero to uh, like more, then you you have a positive impact because you you have this slow dissemination channel at work. So actually, introducing like having some CBD has a positive impact on financial stability if you have a holding limit. But once you make the holding limit too large, then again this fast dissemination channel dominates. And you can see welfare is basically the same, that um, they, they are really like they're almost moving one to one in that model. And our baseline calibration suggests an optimal holding limit of around 1,500 euros. But please bear in mind this is a model, even though I think it's a quantitative model, we made a lot of efforts to make it like, like reasonable. But of course, you know, take these numbers with caution, please. And then if this is our baseline demand for CBDC, and if the demand for CBDC increases, which we call the keen scenario, so it's a bit more optimistic scenario about the adoption of uh, digital euro, then the optimal value would be around 2,500 in this model. Let me skip this slide and come in the interest of time to the conclusion. So what we do here is we, we, we look at the impact of CBDC on financial stability and the economy using like a twofold approach. We provide this novel survey evidence and then we inform, use this to inform and build like a structural macro model. I think the survey indicates substantial demand for CBDC, but also has this slow and fast dissemination. And then what we do is we use this in our macro model to quantify the stability risk and also like kind of like what a potential policy prescription based on that model. And what we find here is that unremunerated CBDC, if you don't complement it further, decreases financial stability and welfare, but actually once you complement it with a holding limit, this reverses the results and has a positive impact on financial stability and welfare. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we have, yeah, there she is. Uh, Katrin, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. And unfortunately, I'm not feeling well this morning. So uh, thanks also to uh, Anja and Stefan for making it possible that I can discuss this uh, virtually. So um, please go to the next slide. And yeah, of course, these are my own views and not the views of the ECB. And the next one, yes. So first, let me say it's a great paper. So it's a topic that is highly relevant in view of the possible risks that are associated with the potential introduction of a digital euro. And uh, what is especially nice in this paper is that the authors combine normal and crisis times in a single model. And they analyze the effects of holding limits and remuneration. And in addition to that, they also offer some survey evidence on the digital euro. So it's a must read for anybody who is interested in CBDC. And it is very rich. So in fact, uh, one of my comments is that's in fact two, two papers and not only one. And I think one of my recommendations is, um, do you really want to keep both of them in the single paper? Because uh, the model starts, I think, on page 20, when the reader is always all, almost already kind of exhausted of, of uh, the, the whole survey evidence. So my suggestion is to split it into two, two papers. And then the model is quite complex. So Matthias presented the, uh, his slides almost without equations, but I can assure you there are many of them in the paper. And I will concentrate my discussion on the model part, so I will say less about the survey. And yes, please, next slide. So the interaction in the model is, the interaction of the slow and the fast dissemination is key. So the CBDC reduces the liquidity premium that banks can earn on deposits. This lowers the deposit base because um, banks don't offer as many deposits as they would uh, without a CBDC. And it makes it also more difficult for banks to attract deposit when a run has happened. So the first effect is um, conducive for financial stability because um, there is a lower deposit base. The second effect is less positive because after a run, it's harder for banks to build up deposits again. Um, CBDC lowers the threshold for a run as it allows households to shift away from deposits more easily. So 
uh, Matthias explained, there is less, uh, there is no storage cost for CBDC, so households can easily shift into CBDC. They know that, they anticipate that. This means that they run earlier than uh, in the case without CBDC, and the run probability is um, increased. However, if there is a CBDC, the deposit base is smaller, and the bank run is therefore less severe. And what does mean does severe mean? So it's uh, in the background there is a typical New Keynesian model where um, banks invest into the securities of a firm, and uh, if banks uh, have to reduce deposits, this means that uh, they have to shed securities. There is a fire sa uh, fire sale price. Households need to take up the securities or the central bank, and it's assumed that they are less e uh, efficient in investing. So there is a loss, a wealth loss by uh, this one. Um, overall, the introduction of CBDC lowers welfare because the increased risk of a bank run dominates the gains that arise from the lower holding costs of a CBDC. And therefore, it's fairly obvious that a holding limit is a good thing because um, it limits the shift uh, into CBDC during a bank run. And uh, we have the welfare gains from CBDC in, in non-crisis times. A time-varying CBDC remuneration increases welfare even more because on the one hand, in the good times when a credit boom takes place, uh, interest rates can be ra uh, raised on the CBDC. So there is more demand for CBDC, there is less demand for deposits, so the leveraging of the banking sector is uh, reduced. And on the other hand, uh, when there is a run, interest rates turn negative, this discourages the run. So we have benefits on both sides of the cycle and uh, welfare uh, remuneration is uh, welfare increasing even more so than a limit. Next slide, please. So I have some general comments. First, uh, the co one comment is how CBDC is modeled. So Matthias said it's modeled as a superior store of value that entails no holding costs. And this is probably not uh, fully aligned with the intention of the ECB uh, with the digital euro, because um, all, public, all our communication is highlighting that it's a means of payment and it's not a store of value. Eh? So the, the key feature of a digital euro would be um, it means as a means of transaction. However, in the model, uh, we have an expansion of the set of liquid assets uh, through a CBDC but uh, it's not superior to cash or deposits in terms of transaction services. The other remark that I have is that uh, slow disintermediation does not to seem to be very harmful in the model. Um, so central banks hold more security and is less efficient than banks, but cash holding costs are reduced. So it's assumed, I, I think it's a result of the model that um, the shift of um, banks holding the uh, securities of the firm uh, to the central bank or households holding securities of the firm is um, lowering wealth less than um, the reduction in cost, uh, cash holding costs. And I right, was Katrin, wondering- five more minutes, please. Yeah, I was wondering whether this is a realistic assumption. Uh, for me, uh, moreover, time varying CBDC remuneration uh, which is negative during runs yields higher welfare than a holding limit, but this might be politically difficult to implement. Next slide. So in the uh, nutshell, the model implies that households can invest into deposits, cash, CBDC, and firm securities. So the deposits yield a return if there is no run, and this return is reduced if a run occurs because the bank has to sell its securities at a fire sale price, price and uh, it probably cannot reimburse uh, the depositors in full. Cash has a quadratic holding cost, and CBDC is safe, and either it may or it may not be remunerated. Um, the advantages of CBDC are modeled, uh, so, or the means of transaction in this model, are modeled through a transaction cost that depends on the ratio of consumption to liquid assets. And the liquid assets are defined uh, as in the formula below, that's a typical CES aggregator, and there it can be seen that there is no particular advantage from CBDC. So households demand CBDC because it expands the uh, variety of assets, they love variety, but um, it's equally good in uh, acquiring consumption goods than either cash or um, uh, demand deposits. And I think this is not fully in line with uh, what 
I would think of the advantages of CBDC. Next slide. The model is very complex. So households will only hold deposits at banks if they believe they will be redeemed at the agreed interest rate. And banks can invest in two different types of secu uh, securities, a good security with a high mean and a lower variance than the bad security. And this is something I, was, I found puzzling. So it's, uh, the, the good security dominates the bad one. Moreover, banks then return, uh, earn a return that is a unity if the bank invests in a good security, but that it follows a log normal distribution for the bad security. And the paper states that limited liability of the bank can make investment in the bad security attractive for the bank. Next slide. A run wipes out the complete banking sector. So households move into cash, CBDC and securities, uh, and this uh, leads to a drop in asset prices. And what is nice from the model is that it generates a time varying endogenous run probability that on the one hand uh, depends on the state of the economy, which is the X variable, but on the other hand, uh, it's a sunspot shock that triggers a run. And a uh, run can only occur if banks are fragile. This means that they can cover deposit withdrawals at the fundamental price, but not at the fire sale price for security and a sunspot uh, shock occurs. So next slide. So this creates time-varying leverage and endogenous run probability, but I have a few questions. So first, this omega uh, J shock is particular to a bank J. And can it be that a bank goes bankrupt without triggering a systemic crisis? And it's also not clear to me at which point in time banks invest into the bad security. So it's said that banks' incentive constraint ensures that the good security is chosen in equilibrium, but investment in the bad security is an off-equilibrium uh, strategy. So is there any investment in the bad uh, security at all? And how is the timing of the sunspot shock? When do households and banks learn about this shock? I think it uh, would be helpful for understanding the, the uh, unfolding of events in the paper. Next slide. Sorry, we have like one so, minute left. Yeah, that's for the authors. And uh, next, so I'll go to the final slide now. Let me wrap up. So it's a really nice paper with a rich structure and policy relevant conclusions. I would have three main recommendations. So first, putting the survey results into a separate paper, focusing the description of the model on the interactions between households and banks that in my view are key to the model and uh, most interesting. And I think it would also be helpful for the reader if you could elaborate more on the results, in particular on the holding limits and the remuneration, as well as the relative benefits of these two uh, parts. Uh, overall, let me say I very much enjoyed uh, reading the paper and um, yeah, I hope you, my, my uh, views are helpful for, for a revision. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Katrin, and speedy recovery to you. Um, Let's take questions from the floor before I give back to Matthias. Yes, please. Gentlemen, the light jacket. Uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, about the positive effect on financial stability, uh, which goes through the leverage ratio. And I, I understand that it's the uh, denominator, so the total assets that decreases. And I wonder what's the role of equity in your model, uh, uh, so the numerator of the leverage ratio. Uh, and then the second is that, uh, of course, uh, in the policy discussion, we, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's holding limits and remuneration that's considered. And that's why I think it's also in the paper. But I wonder if in, in your model, you can also say something about whether these are actually, let's say, optimal solutions rather than maybe more standard uh, 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 regulatory ratios, such as uh, increasing capital requirements or liquidity requirements. Because in principle, it's just, uh, you know, depositors are more tempted to run, which with CBDC, which is not, you know, it, it's not something that non-standard uh, in, uh, in regulation. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Very nice presentation. I was um, thinking about, you know, when we think about the limit to the to CDBC, I mean, it's an obvious strategy, right, for introducing it. At the same time, we are kind of, let's say, putting a, a threshold on the innovation, right? So, and it can be that 
households become much more interested in this going forward than they are you know in your current survey which is before any implementation so i wonder whether you know you could also explore other ways to address financial stability issues that go beyond this threshold so you know one could think about deposit insurance which i'm not sure is in your model but you know extending this deposit insurance what would be the effect of that and also the other thing that i could think of is CDBC's uh, central bank liability, what does the central bank do with the assets? So what if there is some sort of stable funding to the banks from the central bank uh, in this model setup? Now, what will the result be? I have no idea. But you know, even if the result is that those alternative ways are not working, this would give arguments in favor of having those limits. So in that sense, it could be helpful. Thanks. Thank you. OK, I have one more here, and then I have Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for the nice presentation. I have two questions. The first one is uh, with regard to the slow intermediation. Uh, if I understood your argument right, you say the leverage is decreased and therefore financial stability increase. But um, if leverage is decreased, I think the financing of the real economy is either driven to other uh, players in the financial system, probably unregulated players, or the uh, financing of the real economy is reduced at all. Uh, I mean, that aspect would, uh, as a second round effect, create implications for financial stability as well, I guess. Uh, do you see a limit there, or is that well beyond uh, all your um, Modeling and the second question is related uh, uh, to this bank run thing. I think important also is the granularity of deposits. So if you if you have um, a huge amount of of small deposits, then uh, this bank run scenario may be more severe than if you have only huge amount of uh, deposits. Have you considered that? Thank you. Okay, last comment, Lafa, please. Yeah, uh, uh, this is a question about the survey. Uh, I, I, you, you said that this was conducted in the uh, together with a, a survey that the Bundesbank carries, right? So I wonder if you have information about covariates, uh, i.e., uh, education, income, age, gender, uh, and how they correlate with the two questions that you have in your uh, survey. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of questions too, or comments. Uh, so number one, um, a little bit along the lines what Katrin mentioned, so you don't really seem to model um, the one welfare benefit, I would argue, a CBDC, well, the digital euro, not a CBDC, the digital euro has as a payment system, which is much faster transactions. So kind of uh, efficiency of payments, that's uh, a thing that I kind of uh, missed. Um, the other question I had, I mean, in terms of runs, um, I mean, we know that typically runs, uh, I mean, in most cases behind the run is a solvency issue. It's not really just liquidity. I mean, we see it, it saw it again last year. <clears throat> um, actually, you could say, well, maybe there's a positive effect here because it puts even more pressure on supervisors to carefully supervise banks. Um, um, I'm, I'm nowhere I'm sitting, so I'm saying this, of course, with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, also, I mean, I actually, unlike Katrin, I kind of very much like this empirical motivation for the paper in terms of the survey. But of course, I wonder, I mean, is the survey really a reliable source for information of how people will react during an actual run? Not in terms of hypothetical, uh, but an actual run, and maybe a, a, like an experiment might actually be a better uh, way to go about this. And then finally, uh, just a very simple comment. I mean, we know from the literature that leverage is not really a uh, crisis of fragility pre uh, uh, predictor. It's all about credit growth. So that's just thanks. So over to you for um, what? 85 seconds? <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much for all the questions and especially for the very insightful discussion. So, yeah, a lot of questions. So I think I will start with the easier ones, which are related to the survey. So, it, exactly. So this is the, it's like a monthly survey from the Bundesbank. So we have a lot of information on the characteristics of households. And we actually looked at this dimension, but the, the key driver for the uptake of it was actually, so one thing that really stood out was there was a question on the trust in the ECB in that month. And really trust or distrust in the ECB was a key driver for the uptake in, in CBDC. 
So we, we, we did it a bit more and we actually now rerun the survey uh, this, this year where we want to focus more on heterogeneity. So that comes more up from that side, but for now I can say trust ECB is very important. And um, yeah, so I think that that's to the, yeah, I think that's to the survey and to the to the fastest animation part of the survey, I think coming to your question, no, I fully agree. I mean, what, what is, what do households think about? But we also, what we did, we did some treatment where we gave some additional information and we could show them basically, if we give them more information about the stability of the digital euro, then they would actually run more to the digital euro. But, but I mean, and actually to inform the model, we use more the uptake in normal times. That is what we put as a model parameter in because I fully agree to you. This is like, it's hypothetical evidence. It's very hard for households to imagine how to behave in a, in a, banking, uh, in a banking crisis. And then I think about the, there were like a lot of good comments on, 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 the, on the model. So I hope I can do a bit justice to all the questions. Um, so I think like how to model CBDC, I mean, I fully agree to people who, who say that could be done better. I mean, this is a macro model. There has been not much. So I think what we do, because our dimension is really like putting the runner, so we kind of like took like a state of the art thing on how to model CBDC. But um, it, I think the state of the art could be improved. Let me say this, but I think what we do is state of the art, but it could be better. You should, people should think harder than a CS aggregator. And um, yeah, so, so I think there, yeah, let me also maybe say say one more thing about the optimal solution. So, I mean, yeah, now it's it's very applied. I mean, you, you can play a little bit more around, but I think we, we cannot like derive like a Ramsey planner or, or something really complicated. It just takes too long to to solve the model. And um, and I think that the other important point was like a bit about this, this I mean, what does the central bank balance sheet does? So we, we take the, I mean, one of our, like Tim actually has a paper on that. And I mean, we, we thought very careful about it, a bit like what you can do numerically limits us a little bit. But yeah, I mean, if you would go this Pruno Meyer Niepold result, then that it would be immediately perfectly channeled from CBDC, from the central bank back to the to the banks. I mean, then there would be no runs. Um, and I think the last comment is about what is this model framework. So in the model, we we, we assume this is like a run-prone financial system, and then therefore we start off and check how CBDC affects it. And thank you very much again for all the input. Thank you very much, Matthias.